context, um, we are pretty um, familiar with SmartFear, um, which provides a combination of tools to build, test, and monitor software. APIs are important to their products, and we have Martin McDonald, the lead solution architect at SmartFear, joining us to share his knowledge about definition-driven API development, streamlining your API development with OAS. Martin, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Let me just uh, share my screen. And can you guys just let me know if you can see the PowerPoint? Should be good now. Yeah, all good. Okay. Um, okay, guys. So thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about definition, def definition, definition-driven API development, streamlining your API development uh, with OpenAPI. So again, my name is Martin. Um, I'm the lead solution architect for APAC for SmartBear. So the session today is going to be primarily based around OpenAPI specification, um, and we're going to dive into a couple areas around, you know, where OAS. Um, filters in with the likes of virtualization, uh, with the likes of code generation, and with the likes of uh, testing uh, as well. So before we dive into a bit further, the first thing that we really want to do here is, I suppose, understand definition-driven um, API development. So when we talk about an API-first approach, really, we're really focusing on the API um, as our main kind of um, citizen, as this case. You know, it's our main driver. It's the front seat passenger. Um, it's before we get to the initial phases of uh, handing this particular API off. So we have our API interface, as you can see here on screen. And then we may have um, parts of this that are also stubbed out. So we have a mock maybe that's sitting in behind it. And you'll hear me referencing mocks and virtualization throughout the session because that's one of the key um, approaches when we talk about uh, definition-driven approaches. So we have our API interface. We have our mock in behind. This then allows us to hand this particular um, functionality um, of the API off to our front-end developers to allow them to go ahead and work on specific clients. And then also to our back-end developers who can go ahead and work on specific implementations. Again, we're focusing on the API first perspective. The API isn't fully developed by any means. We can go ahead and hand off that implementation. So back-end developers can go ahead and build out logic. Uh, front-end developers can go ahead and make sure that you know static responses uh, are defined as part of a, a mock. So in terms of mocks, you may go ahead and build that in. It may be part of a specific tool. So what we're really saying here is that an API-first approach involves having your APIs at the first um, as the first and primary uh, element as part of your API uh, product and service strategy. So that'll be kind of you know focusing on what we are going to be discussing a bit further into today. We're treating it as the main uh, front seat driver, as, as I like to call it. This makes sure that we have um, synchronization and there's no dependencies between our front end developers, our back end developers, and also other stakeholders. So we may also have testers um, that are you know, going to uh, take in, into account this particular mocked environment um, when we're talking about um, you know, not only the development side of things, but also a uh, testing side of things as well. And we'll talk a bit more around the common vocabulary uh, throughout the session. OK, so the definition-driven answer. So definition-driven API development advocates uh, for designing the API's contract first before any other lifecycle operation. So what we're re really saying here is that we have our definition. We have that API design first perspective. This allows to drive implementation, maintenance, and also consumption. So we're talking about implementation, meaning that we're handing this particular um, definition off to our uh, back-end developers. They can build in logic to, um, I suppose, operate the API to make sure that it's uh, a very clean API. It uh, is using the auto-mocking capabilities. Um, it's using an advanced service uh, virtualization side of things as well, where you're not only um, mocking out or stubbing out the responses and making sure that you're getting a 200 OK, but you're also adding in business logic. If I end up um, adding in a particular parameter, will that give me a specific response in that case as well? Maintenance, again, we're adding in maybe multiple responses responses, maybe inside of our definition that we've um, built as part of our uh, specification. 
we may have only defined uh, a number of uh, responses, but maybe we want to add in more responses in that case as well. So we're adding in maintenance, we're refactoring, we're making updates uh, based off the initial definition. And then consumption. So we want to be able to you know, output this, get feedback in terms of the design, get feedback in terms of the initial parts. Again, we're in the phase that we're not actually fully developing um, the API as such. We're still in that uh, definition-driven approach. Okay, so we talk about a co common vocabulary and why this is important. So it's important because it's not only going to be developers that are associated with the definition framework. It's also going to be technical writers. It's going to be architects. It's going to be um, testers. It's going to be other stakeholders. So we want to have um, that common understanding of what we're working on. We want to make sure that it's also machine and human readable and also language uh, and maybe also tool agnostic. So you know, maybe we're working with um, specific tools from a pipeline perspective, uh, as mentioned in the kind of previous uh, talk, that you know, it's Jenkins, it's Git, um, that you know, we're able to understand um, from a common scenario uh, what the particular definition and framework that we're describing is on. And again, when we talk about OpenAPI, uh, I know a lot of people, of course, attending this week um, are very familiar, but it again, you know, it is the world standard for defining RESTful APIs. So if we have that kind of common insight and common understanding across teams, uh, it's going to make sure that there's a lot more synchronization and trust across teams. And it's going to allow teams to work um, at their own um, initiative and make sure that there's a, a, you know, a common understanding between teams as well. So what are some of the advantages when we talk about definition-driven development, uh, reducing interdependencies, allowing teams to work at their own pace. This would then lead to faster development and delivery, and then easier expansion into uh, different interfaces, clients, and views. And this all leads to faster development. So point one and two, you're not going to get faster development and delivery unless you allow teams to work and synchronize together and make sure that there's um, you know, not interdependencies. Um, we're not waiting for the, the back-end team, or we're not waiting for the front-end team, or we're not waiting for the testers. We can go ahead and um, provide that definition to our testers, but we can continue working on front-end development at the same time. Really, we're talking here about parallel development and parallel execution. Um, and it's something that, you know, we definitely talk a, a lot about here at Smartbar when we're talking to our uh, specific clients. Um, this will then lead to faster development and delivery, more accurate delivery as well, should I add, uh, because we have that common understanding. We're allowing teams to collaborate. Uh, maybe they're using a specific tool. Maybe they're just using an open source solution, uh, or maybe they're just uh, using something that's built in-house as well. Easier expansion uh, to different interfaces, clients, and views, uh, again, allows us to be a lot more, um, I suppose, common, a lot more um, easier to drive across different interfaces, different clients and views, because again, it's all part of the same angle in terms of the open API specification. And then developer-friendly services to build ecosystems and platforms. So this again could lead to new revenue channels and, and growth. Um, we have that common interface, that common example in terms of open API specification. It's easy to understand. And you're really putting yourself in your customer's shoes when you're developing and designing these APIs to say, you know, if I am going to hand this off to a consumer, um, what, what are they going to think about when they look at the documentation? Are they going to find it easier to understand? Uh, will they be able to find the guidelines and understand the guidelines of this particular API documentation? OK. so. OAS opens a world of possibilities um, in terms of the areas of mocking. So we can go ahead and build out mocks, prototypes, as production-like as possible. We can add in that business logic, but it's still going to sit on a particular server, um, being at our local host or being at you know, a deployed server in our environment. We can also go ahead and build out a common design, making sure that there's, uh, I would say, standardization uh, across our APIs, uh, making sure that we have object, object reuse, we have callbacks, we have a similar structure when we're talking about multiple teams working on the open API spec uh, specification, um, working with clients, so generating client libraries. Uh, deployment and runtime, again, something that's really important, but sometimes we probably don't think about it enough, is that do I want to run security checks against it? Maybe top 10 OWASP vulnerabilities, as an example. Uh, monitoring, so after we've gone ahead and deployed, uh, do we want to monitor based on availability, uh, functional correctness, uh, performance? Um, and do we also want to look at the likes of caching as well? Um, documentation, again, 
most important uh, realistically but we see so many different companies now that you know want this clean uh, documentation as part of their developer portal and um, building portals specifically based on, on documentation that it's clear and concise for the consumer to be able to understand what the API is again I think that would be the end goal is actually understanding what the API is so they want to use that particular API we're treating it as a product as such uh, virtualization, and you'll hear me talk a bit about virtualization um, over the next couple of minutes, um, making sure that we have something that is as close to production as possible, but we can play around with it, we can customize it, we can change the responses, uh, we can start sending error codes at certain points in time, we can change um, a behavior to say, okay, what happens if we do hit a 200, uh, or what if happens if we hit a 404, and then also testing. Um, so if that's building out a regression test, if that's building out a unit test, we want to be able to build this on top of our definition. Um, if that's a functional test, if that's a security test, and also if that's a load test um, as well, we want to be able to make it as uh, clean and easy as possible. And these are only some of the areas um, scratching the surface. And then also implementation. Uh, we can go ahead and generate that server code artifacts. Um, and again, I've been, you know, he he being, uh, heard that being talked across a number of talks today is that, you know, generating the server codes, generating the client SDKs, uh, it's something that's extremely important. So really open um, API specification opens a world of all of these uh, possibilities, uh, not just design and documentation, but much, much more. Okay, so definitions touch every phase of the life cycle. So firstly, from a design perspective, uh, from a document perspective, from a virtualization perspective, as we mentioned, um, from generating that code, and also from a testing perspective as well. And again, we're talking a bit about parallel development uh, going between last slide and this slide. We are focusing on design in terms of one team and documentation maybe from another. Maybe that virtualization is part of that um, definition. So we've actually built the virtualization or the advanced mock uh, based on the definition. And then we can start building and developing against it. We can go ahead and generate our client SDKs, hand them off to consumers um, internally, externally in terms of consumers. And then we can hand off the um, API to our testers. Maybe they're testing against a virtual service. Maybe they're just testing against that particular server. So. There's so many different possibilities in terms of the way that we focus in from a lifecycle perspective. And all of these items on the right-hand side uh, are associated with, with each other when we talk about parallel uh, tracking, parallel development, uh, parallel um, implementations. Um, it's just, I suppose, an understanding of um, who is doing it, who is, uh, who is going to be in charge of doing it, is the testing team going to you know, work directly with uh, some of the developers? So these are obviously calls that need to be made. So in terms of uh, documentation um, from the definition, some of, I suppose, the key benefits, uh, key areas, um, auto-generate from the contract, uh, being able to be hosted anywhere, and then being fully interactive. Again, from, some of you will be aware of uh, Swagger in terms of uh, a tool, in terms of Swagger UI, Swagger Editor, Swagger CodeGen. Um, again, there are so many other tools that have been mentioned uh, over the course of today as well, but obviously a lot of people will be familiar with Swagger as well. Um, in terms of, I suppose, easiness and I suppose popularity, because you know obviously it's been around for a number of years in terms of the open source market, um, it allows you to go ahead and you know be very flexible. Uh, I think that is, you know, we can see uh, a number of companies build their own um, specific tooling in in house based on uh, Open API and, and based on Swagger tooling. But I suppose the fact that we're fully interactive, that we have that interactive documentation, uh, that it can be hosted on a server anywhere, uh, and that you can go ahead and not only auto-generate um, from the contract, but you can also take that definition and then push it across the life cycle as well. Um, really, from a Swagger tooling perspective, you're only hitting the initial point. Okay, so OAS in terms of search and search, uh, service virtualization, where does that come into play? So essentially, what is service virtualization? We often hear of mocking, we often hear of advanced mocking, but virtualization accurately mimics or simulates behavior of components that are unavailable or difficult to access during software development and beyond. So take an example of um, you know working with a Salesforce application or an ERP, um, you might not always have uh, access to it fully, but you could go ahead and route to that, capturing the responses, and then store them in a virtual service. This means that you can go ahead and use these particular um, responses uh, throughout um, 
aspects of testing and, and development as well. Um, an example that we always um, come across here when we're talking about smart pair is, you know, Google Maps APIs in terms of, uh, you know, limit calls. You may have 10,000 calls uh, a day in terms of limits. Um, if you wanted to run a load test against that, uh, if you have an application that is associated with Google Maps, then you're going to hit that 10,000 uh, user limit quite quickly. So what you can do in that case is route to the live endpoint, which is maps.googleapis.com, capture the um, responses in terms of you know, uh, longitude, latitude, uh, wherever you want to point to, and then store that in a virtual service. You could then run a load test against that virtual service uh, based on your local host or based on it being deployed inside of your network. So again, you're able to go ahead and throttle that particular API, even though it's virtualized, obviously you need to you know, stand up your own infrastructure to do that. But again, it's just an example in terms of where virtualization comes into play. So you can virtualize a number of different things. If it's, uh, I suppose, device um, calls, database, JDBC, JDBC connections to a database, API calls specifically, and then also you can simulate uh, network uh, bandwidth and uh, capacity. So if you wanted to say, um, you know, there's going to be certain latency in terms of my network at a certain time when I'm developing against the API, or especially when I'm testing against the API, uh, that's where it comes into play. So where does this particular virtualization from the definition come into play in terms of a workflow? So we have our definition. Here we have our virtualization. We can hand this off to our developers, testers, and other stakeholders. They can interact with the virtual, uh, the virtual service. We could also hand this off to our consumers. Then we can go ahead and carry that information and develop, and the consumer is providing feedback to the developers and the testers all times. So when we've gone through this process, we're capturing information early in the process to say how things could be done better. We're understanding from a functional perspective, a load per perspective, and we're also developing against this particular virtual API at the same time. So our front-end developers are consistently working, our testers are testing, and then our consumers are providing feedback all the time. This leads us to a quicker development process. When we talk about OIS and code generation, again, a lot of people will be familiar from a, a code generation perspective. Where does it come into play? Well, the OIS definition allows you to generate the server stubs and client SDKs directly from the definition in an automatic perspective. So again, we have our code generation, in this case, powered by um, the Swagger tooling. Here we can go ahead and um, provide that server stub to our developer, in this case, backend developer. Um, and we can also generate our client SDKs and then provide them to the consumer who will be able to, you know, be able to um, implement um, based on the code generation and the specific languages that are in play uh, as well. And then OAS and testing. Again, a piece that is also important, but uh, sometimes um, can be complicated uh, in terms of, I suppose, who's taking ownership of what, but it can be a lot easier. We can go ahead and generate test cases directly from the contract. We can do this by using specific tools in terms of the open source market, professional tools, et cetera, uh, just as a reference in terms of SOAP UI because of its um, familiarity with a lot of people. Again, if it's Postman or any other tools in play as well, you can go ahead and import directly to the specific tool, import the definition, should I say. This will allow you to then build test cases, um, maybe a regression suite. The testers can easily go ahead and uh, build these specific test cases. They can automate them. And then if there's changes to the API, we can go ahead and focus on that refactoring uh, from here as well. OK, um, so in summary, from the kind of quick presentation today, open API specification, machine and human readable. Um, OAS allows for that parallel development that I talked about. So designers, developers, and testers uh, being able to work amongst each other in synchronization with that common language, that common framework. Um, OAS can be driven across the API lifecycle when we talk about designing documentation, um, virtualization, generating code, um, you know, many, many more areas as such. Virtualization allows to build an advanced mock uh, from the definition uh, that is dynamic, so we can change the values rather than be static. We can, you know, have it as production-like as possible. Think about testing against uh, a financial service, we can go ahead and mock different calls to a, a credit card system, um, a financial system, rather than that just one call in that case as well. So we can choose data from um, Excel sheets, JDBC connections. So we're using real world data in a virtual service as such. 
And then it is also possible to build a test in minutes directly from the OpenAPI uh, definition using um, open source or professional testing tools. OK, um, so yeah, thanks very much for your time today, guys. Uh, you can reach me at martin.mcdonough at smartbear.com. Uh, but yeah, um, if there's any questions, uh, please let me know. Thank you, Martin. Um, it's a really great presentation. So um, I do see a question um, in the chat. So another Martin is asking, how do you keep the server code in sync with the documentation? Let's say if someone adds a field in the Swagger, how do you update the code? Yeah, so can you just repeat that? Sorry, just, just missed it. Yeah. Oh, so you... how do you keep the server code in sync with the documentation? Um, he's referring to the Swagger spec. Let's say if someone adds a field in the Swagger, how do you update the code? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question. Um, I think it's it's a matter of ownership in terms of, it's not really from the actual, the, the, I suppose, the tooling side of things. It's, it's, I suppose, taking ownership in terms of, I suppose, who's managing the, who's managing the code side of things, who's managing the, um, the documentation side of things. Is it going to be defined by the same person? Is it going to be uh, defined by um, a, a more, more than one person as well? So I think usually what we'll see is that you know, when we're generating uh, client code or server code, um, that's going to be defined by either the front end developer or the or the back end developer, um, and then someone may be taking ownership of the documentation as well. So, in terms of I suppose answering that question, it's more of defining who's in charge. Um, I think is, is is kind of the main aspect. I I hope that answers the question, but again, um, if there's any other feedback, that would be great. Cool, thank you. Um, and um, I have a question for you. So you're talking about um, the API lifecycle. So could you could you talk about um, what is the traditional workflow um, for the definition driven development with the API life? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so lifecycle. Yeah, so I think it, it, it kind of goes down two streams. Like one is obviously where we're talking about, um, is it gonna be that going down the virtualization route or is it going to be going down the kind of testing route so defining that initial phase as the api is the product um the initial phase is i suppose understanding that second phase is um are you going to be using you know in an individual mock are you going to be using a set of virtualized services uh, based on each resource and then thirdly is um you know where is the next phase of that going is it going to go, go going to go down the testing route are you going to hand this off to testers are you going to hand this off to front-end developers so in terms of a kind of a workflow you design your API, and then you can go ahead and create that mock or that set of virtual services um, for maybe static or uh, dynamic-based responses. Um, and then you can go ahead and then have the um, ability to hand off to testers, hand off to uh, front-end developers. And that's really a common phase when we talk about design first leading into um, other areas of the life cycle, like I mentioned. Thank you. Um, so is there any questions um, who wants to raise with Martin? You can just simply put it in the chat. By the way, someone someone mentioned in the chat that um, the orange in your background and in your slide are aligned with the logo color. Yeah, that was planned. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, so if there there is no more questions um, for Martin, um, so um, you can feel free to take a few minute break, or ask, do you want to mention anything, Martin? Not all good for me. Just if there's any other questions, um, but yeah, thanks very much for for your time today, guys. And if there's any questions, um, feel free to just come. Yeah, to the yeah, sure, no problem. Jokes.